mile range is, is pretty good. It's, it's uh, for a lot of customers that are just looking to distribute their um, their infrastructure a little bit. Very high speeds here. So again, typically these 80 gigahertz systems are full duplex, so you're going to get 2.5 gigabits of speed there. The only uh, you know the application are virtually well good anywhere. You just have to be uh, keep in, in mind the distance. These types of systems can support any application as long as you don't need to go more than six miles or ten kilometers. So really, the general caveat going f to, from the uh, microwave down to, uh, across to the uh, the millimeter wave technology at the 80 gigahertz. As you advance up the spectrum, um, climate issues, uh, weather has to have to start have a, have an effect on the signal. Generally, below six gigahertz, you're okay. But as you go beyond six gigahertz, which is where this microwave these microwave systems start, you have to be more careful of that. But when you engineer the systems properly and, and uh, introduce fade margins and things like that, you can create a pretty robust system. Okay, so just going to the next slide, uh, we're going to look at the components of a licensed system. Just a general one. So first of all, the most important thing is, is, is an FCC license. You can have all the other pieces, but if you're not able to transmit legally, you, you can't do anything. Uh, from the hardware standpoint, the two main pieces are the, it's, uh, these systems typically incorporate what's called a split box design. It allows you to have the, uh, the radio pieces where, out where they need to be outside, uh, they don't, and then the, uh, all the ports, the user ports, where they should be indoors on the rack where they belong and where they're traditionally found. So uh, the IDU or the indoor unit uh, finds itself in the, in the uh, rack, rack room or the wiring closet, wherever the, the, the communications room is. And then there's the outdoor unit or the ODU, which is a ruggedized, usually a NEMA or IP rated box that can take the elements, extreme cold or, 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 or heat, uh, so that you know, they can find themselves anywhere in Alaska or in, uh, in, 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 the, in the desert, New Mexico if they have to, or Arizona. And uh, so that's what, those are the main pieces. Then, as far as the physical cabling is concerned, you could be using you're, you're always using um, coax cabling, but in some cases, depending on where you are, you might need to use waveguide, depending on uh, how robust the system has to be. The uh, outdoor unit, the ODU, and the antennas use what's called a rectangular Remick uh, connector. And we should mention that because it's interesting because it's not actually an IEEE or, a C or any kind of standard out there, but it's a de facto one. It's just by sheer volume of people out in the industry and, and uh, manufacturers adopting this type of interface, it's, it's a de facto standard. So everyone's using it, so it's good to be familiar with it because chances are that's what the, uh, the antennas are going to use to bolt on that you'll be using. So and, and t talking about the antennas, you got to consider that because of these systems are going, uh, they're high speed and they're going long distances, they're going, going to be uh, using large, heavy antennas. Typically, you start with a point-to-point -point system, a backhaul at two-foot antennas. I mean, you can go with smaller ones, but typically you would start there, and you can have. It's not. It's it's uh, not. It's very common to have six-foot antennas. I worked on an application a few years back, uh, very long distance that went 90 kilometers, it was uh, 12 foot dishes that they were using for that system. So you, you literally have to assemble these uh, antennas on site because they're so big. And you have to make sure that you have telco grade uh, uh, mounting tower assets to support these things because you know, it's, that's important. And also you, you, when you look at components, you look at this, um, these one plus zero or, or one plus one configurations, we just want to talk about that. That basically has to do with redundancy. And uh, it helps with the robustness of the, of the system. There's a saying in, in the industry that you know devices. Everyone knows anybody who knows devices that they they can fail. It's normal for them to fail, but the system can't fail. So pieces of a system can fail, but the, the whole overall system shouldn't. It's sort of like an organization. If someone's sick, there's another employee around that you know has a, their own unique function, but they're there to help fill in for that person when they're not available. So basically, that's how this works. You would have a 1.0 configuration. The first number would refer to the active radios that are transmitting on the production network, and then the second number that's being added to the plus would be the backup radio. So in a 1.0 or 1 plus 0 configuration, you'd just be having one standalone unit. If it fails, you might have a spare offline that you could fire up, and then you'd run that. In a 1 plus 1 scenario, you would have one radio running primary and one standing by as a backup, so if the, the moment of a failure, the second radio would kick in. 
Um, another way around that to add redundancy would be a 2 plus 0 configuration where you're having two radios running parallel to each other. And then uh, if one fails, then the other one would take over and you wouldn't lose your link completely. You would have, you, it would go down to half. So these are just different approaches to uh, how it, people would deploy these systems. So going to the next slide, we would just wanted to spend some time on, uh, on the, uh, the waveguide transmission line. Not every deployment is going to require this, but we want to talk about it just in case. In, uh, in some cases where direct mounting to antenna isn't an option, this might be due to the fact that um, just for mount, uh, be, uh, being uh, locating on the tower or uh, it's just not available, you uh, may need to use a, a waveguide. It's very specific to frequency, and uh, typically the higher frequency you go, the smaller it gets. It's extremely low loss. It's expensive, but it's low loss, and you can engineer uh, a system with virtually no loss uh, on the system. Considering with coax cable, with LMR 400, you can lose as much as 7 dB over 100 feet with that stuff. So this stuff, you would have almost no loss at all. It's copper. It can either be flexible or fixed waveguide. And depending on where you're deploying this, if you're somewhere where there's, it's, it's humid, something uh, in a humid environment, and it's common for um, Caribbean-type uh, tropical telcos to deploy these things because of the hurricanes and stuff, for, they're able to, to recover from those things quickly. But anyway, they could require a, a pressurization dehydrator to uh, maintain the performance of the waveguide. Basically, it makes sure that it, it takes, it purges the moisture off of the waveguide to make sure that the waveguide doesn't get altered or detuned in, in any way by the, through the water. And uh, these types of systems are available from high-end companies like Andrew Corporation or RFS Cable Wave for these, but they have entry-level systems. There's the, an example of that here, this pressurization, pressurizer, it uh, dehydrated. This, this one has a list price of under $1,000. So if you had to add these things, it's not, it won't cost you an arm and a leg for an entry-level system to do this. But like I said, you won't always need this, but it's good to mention that you'd be aware that it is a possibility. So just to get a nice visual of the couple of screens that we just did about the components, this is, this is just a diagram of a license system. So here you have the, in, the antenna, and then you've got it coupled to the ODU that we spoke about, the outdoor unit, and then that's uh, attached to a pole, a, a telco grade tower pole, um, through some kind of gimbal mount. That usually you give, you, you do a general fix to the to the pole or the, the uh, structure of the arm, and then you, but then once it's it's uh, stable, you don't have to hold on to it anymore. That you would then do some fine tuning with some other bolts, and then you would have your coax IF cable running from uh, in this uh, right down the system. And then you would go back into the, to a rack where, you, where you'd have the uh, indoor unit. And then you'd have the user uh, ports here that would typically, I mean, they could be anything from um, RJ48, but typically the most popular connectors there would be RJ45, Cat5 type c connectors that would then act, uh, allow you to link back to a switch of some kind or a router, depending on what you're doing on your production wired network. And then the next slide is the same type of... Uh, picture, except for we're just showing what would be called here a one plus one configuration, which would be referring to the two ODUs here attached with a coupler in the middle that would provide. So if this system was to fail, if this OD, ODU was somehow to, to go down for whatever reason on this uh, deployment here, you'd have the secondary ODU that would kick in and then provide a 100% system with no downtime. Okay, so uh, last component, important piece here is uh, the antennas. So they, uh, typically these types of antennas uh, need to have a, a more focused beam width. And the benefit of that is it allows your directivity of your antenna to be focused in one direction. It's more efficient use of your RF energy. And it also limits your interference because you don't have to worry about interference from all directions. You've got a directional beam. If you have a smaller beam width, You've got a smaller Fresnel zone. You're able to shoot longer distances, and, and then basically your signature across the air is, is smaller and not exposing yourself. It's minimizing your exposure to to what to uh, ambient noise or any kind of inter interference. But even though, of course, it's regulated, but it's just, it's just by nature this helps. So uh, 
Typically, two to six foot parabolic and drum antennas are common. Um, and of course, like I mentioned before, you have to make sure that you have uh, the proper tower assets to be able to support this. Typically, because they're high up on towers, because uh, of the long range, you have to consider the curvature of the Earth. The curvature of the Earth can start to affect point-to-point -point links um, in as little as 10 miles. So, of course, there these antennas are going to find them way up high up in the, on, the, on the towers, which puts extra load from the wind on them. And sometimes, you know, so you might want to consider if it's uh, that, that's a, that's the case to put a radome, which would re reduce the drag on the antenna when wind when it, uh, wind is uh, shooting across of it. Okay, just going to the next slide. What we're going to do here is we're just going to show some examples of uh, different vendors, leading vendors out there that uh, have uh, that offer licensed systems. So, first example would be uh, Proxim. They um, have a product. It's uh, they're they have an affordable system. One of the benefits of these guys, they offer uh, it's the newest version of their GX platform, the GX 800. They offer, in all the popular frequencies, they do 6, 11, 18, and 23 gigahertz. They're pretty quick. They do 622 megabits. They're long distance. And uh, one of the features of these guys special that makes them special is that right out of the box, there's uh, no upgrades necessary. You have access to all the speeds. So uh, there's those guys. Uh, very popular. Uh, uh, oh, actually, I should show you here the bill of materials. This would be a quick... System, so you can always refer back to this if you're ever looking at deploying a Proxim solution. We're going to do this with all of our vendors. Uh, it shows you an example of how to put together a quote so you can make sure that you have all the pieces and how they're broken down. So uh, this is the Motorola PTP800. This is very popular. Uh, Motorola is known and they're legendary for their reliability. And uh, basically, we, we, we've had a lot of good feedback. They've been around for a while. Um, they're very popular. So they do wide range of frequencies. They do 11 gigahertz, they do 18 gigahertz, 23, 26, and 38. Not everybody does 38 gigahertz, but they do. Um, they have very very high speed. They're 368 megabits, very long distance. It's not common to do these systems at you know 60 miles, 70 miles. The uh, interesting feature with the Motorola is that you can uh, expand and you can scale your network. So 